Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the last of this week's studies. As we return to this portion of the book of Daniel and continue looking at the verses that are contained herein, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance so that we might more clearly understand that which we need to understand for this time in earth's history. Shall we now, now ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities that we've had to be able to study this week. We ask, Father, for your continued blessing and for your spirit to join with us so that our minds might be open to that which we need to understand. Please bless our time together. Guide us so that we might understand that which is written in the, in the word of truth and consider that which Uriah Smith had written many years ago. Help us now, Father. Direct us in these paths. Help us together to join together. May your will be done. May your angels attend us. May this conversation and this study be fruitful. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So now, we've covered this in verse 14 in different ways this week. And I think we're, we're fairly understanding that at this point, that we are looking at a group that would come against the king of the south and that the robbers of thy people or the children of the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the daily and the transgression of desolation, the calzone, but they shall fall. Now, in this portion, Smith has written that Antiochus was not the only one who rose up against the infant Ptolemy. Agathocles, his prime minister, having possession of the king's person and conducting the affairs of the kingdom in his stead, was so dissolute and proud in the exercise of his power that the provinces which before were subject to Egypt rebelled. Egypt itself was disturbed by seditious or seditions, and the people of Alexandria rose up against him, causing his sister, his mother, and their associates to be put to death. At the same time, Philip, king of Macedon, entered into a league with Antiochus to divide the dominions of Ptolemy between them, each proposing to take parts which lay nearest and most convenient to him. Here was a rising up against the king of the south, sufficient to fulfill the prophecy, and the very events beyond doubt which the prophecy intended. Now, if I'm reading Smith correctly, he believes that this prophecy began and ended before Christ was born. Would we agree with that? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, happens before Christ is born, because this is pagan Rome. You know, the point that the way he's writing this, that it begins and it ends, that there is no further fulfillment. Well, the... I, I see. well, I don't know if that's, that's quite what he's saying. I mean, he's just looking at the historical application, if that's what you're saying. Well, let's continue then. A new power is now introduced. The robbers of thy people literally says Bishop Newton, the breakers of thy people. Far away on the banks of the Tiber, a kingdom has been nourishing itself with ambitious projects and dark designs. Small and weak at first, it grew with marvelous rapidity in strength and vigor, reaching out cautiously here and there to try its prowess and test the vigor of its warlike arm, till, conscious of its power, it boldly reared its head among the nations of the earth and seized with invincible hand the helm of their affairs. Henceforth, the name of Rome stands upon the historic page, destined for long ages to control the affairs of the world and exert a mighty influence among the nations, even to the end of time. Yeah, so he's not saying that Rome doesn't have to do, do have anything to do with the uh, end time prophecy now uh, just a little point here remember we looked at um, the start of rome which is 753 bc that's the traditional date given for the beginning of the roman kingdom as far as uh, tradition is concerned roman tradition um and we noticed that was 1290 years prior to 538 so just a reminder of that. So just reminded me, well, because he's talking about first that this kingdom rises, you know, far away on the banks of the Tiber. 
Um, right. So, so just reminded me of the beginning of Rome. So it's interesting that he, he does mention this. Yeah. So, um, and of course, it's kind of weird because, you know, Bishop Newton says the breakers of thy people, but they don't put in the children of the breakers of thy people or anything like that, or the sons, which is what it actually says, which we noted that when you add that together, you get seven, six, five, one, the children of the breakers. And um, and that's the number that's in Leviticus 26 for the number seven times. So, so yeah, so this definitely does refer to that, so the Kazon and, and, and this prophetic period relating to the seven times, which is the 2520. Right? Now, lots, lots in there. And as you are so aptly pointing out. Allison. Yes, William? I was going to, I looked up the Hebrew words for um, the Hebrew number for robbers, and it, um, in it's uh, 6530, I think it is, it's mentioned three times. But the, um, I think it, the mean, they, they give a meaning that says destroyers. Okay. Your your Hebrew 6530. That's right. I agree with you. And there are there are six verses that involve this particular word. Now, rule of first mention would take us back to Psalm 17:4. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the path of the destroyer. Isaiah 35, 9, no lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast. So the word is translated from destroyer to ravenous, shall go up there upon, it shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Jeremiah 7, 11, and all subsequent verses translate this as robbers. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But I find it most interesting that these robbers that we're referring to here would also be expressed in Ezekiel 7.22 and Ezekiel 18.10. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my secret place for the robbers shall enter into it and defile it. Along with, if he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, that doeth the like to any one of these things. Now, the robbers of thy people, or the margin reading, the children of the robbers of thy people. How do we address this? I'm not seeing breakers as Smith is quoting this Bishop Newton. So where would this come from? Yeah, but yeah, it doesn't translate into the King James as breakers, but he's just going back to the Hebrew, um, saying that the idea of somebody breaking in, okay. right? That's the idea of the Hebrew word, you know, like break and entering, right? So, um, and so it's interesting in Ezekiel 7, because this is talking about these uh, judgments that are going to come up on Israel by Babylon, right? And if you think about the sons of the destroyers of thy people, which I, I don't know why children, but, uh, but sons would be the literal translation. It, it could really des describe that these are the descendants it, um, because we know that Rome inherits the characteristic of Babylon, right? Which is that 666 symbol. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we could just say that Rome is the son of Babylon, right, of, of these nations that, that it conquers, the descendants, not, not literally, like genetically, but as far as this line of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and that would fit into, you know, the idea that this is the daily. Does that make sense? I'm not disagreeing that. Yeah, that this, that this is paganism, and and that's the reason why it says the sons of the destroyers or the sons of the robbers, whatever you want to, what you want to use, uh, because it's referring to the fact that this is this continuation of Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. So, so Rome, in exalting itself to establish the vision, is the continuation of this line of these kingdoms of, uh, you know, that we see in Daniel two, 
but also in Daniel 7. So that, that's the way I would address that. But rather than that they're just the descendants of the Romans, right? That doesn't really make sense. Um, well, I, and, I, took a, I took a notice to that Jeremiah 7, 11 and Ezekiel 7, 22, it has the um, it has the 22 and 11 in it. That's what I, I that's what I was looking at when I was looking up them verses. Yeah. Okay. Now on the on the other side, I've looked at this. You know, the children of the robbers of thy people, the sons of the robbers of thy people. Whether or not this could have a present truth application as pointing to our apostate Protestantism. Yeah, and then, but we had taken, because we had gone through that a number of times, so we still take the position that in the present truth application, the way that we've drawn it up, that this is referring to the papacy right? in in the present truth, not to apostate Protestantism. So the way that we have put it, you know, because we're saying that in those times, that is, the Civil War from the first day of the first month in 2024 to the first day of the first month in 2030 is 2,187 days. There shall many uh, republicanism in the USA is going to be represented by uh, Philip the fifth, King of Macedon, and Antiochus the third. Stand up is the they have all of this pro- propaganda against the King of the South, against Biden and the Democrats. Then we have uh, the 777 structure is represented because of the word, because of adding sons of the robbers, getting that Sheba, and and the robbers of thy people are papacy. They shall exalt themselves, right? That is, the papacy supports wokeism to establish the vision. And in this case, it's the vision from 1989 to the Sunday law. They shall fall close of probation and seven last plagues. And and the thing is that just remember that we have the fall of pagan Rome, uh, seven four seventy six AD pagan Rome to um seventeen ninety eight papal Rome. So there's this uh two different falls, the fall of pagan Rome, the fall of papal Rome. So we do have papal Rome in there, you know, that that's prefigured they shall fall. But Pagan Rome falls and Papal Rome falls, but we just we just we we in our present truth application, this has been more about because the, the papacy has to be represented in some way because the power that it's fighting against in this battle of the King of the North and the King of the South is battling against the Protestants in the United States. This is a battle. Uh, and the papacy is now going to support wokeism, that it supports Egypt, right? And we have seen that happen, right? The papacy has been supporting Egypt, not supporting Protestant America. Correct. But the republicanism, right? They're going to support the Democrats, you know, the woke America. So there's there's that battle that's going on. And that's That's how we made the present truth application. It's about this civil war going on in the United States. But whether that's correct or not, that's how we did it. Right? So the sons of the breakers, uh, the idea is that this is uh, the papacy. Okay. Now, Smith continued, Rome spoke, and Syria and Macedonia soon found a change coming over the aspect of their dream. The Romans interfered in behalf of the young king of Egypt, determined that he should be protected from the ruin devised by Antiochus and Philip. This was B.C. 200 and was one of the first important inferences of the Romans into the affairs of Syria and Egypt. Rollin furnishes the following succinct account of this matter. Antiochus, king of Syria, and Philip, king of Macedonia, during the reign of Ptolemy Philippator, had discovered the strongest seal for the interest of that monarch and were ready to assist him on all occasions. Yet no sooner was he dead, leaving behind an infant, whom the laws of humanity and justice enjoined them not to disturb in the possession of his father's kingdom, than they immediately joined in a criminal alliance 
and excited each other to shake off the lawful heir and divide his dominions between them. Philip was to have Cabria, Libya, Cyrenaica, and Egypt, and Antiochus, all the rest. With this view, the latter entered into Soli, or is it Coli, Syria, and Palestine, and in less than two campaigns made an entire conquest of the two provinces with all their cities and dependencies. Their guilt, said Polybius, would not have been quite so glaring had they, like tyrants, endeavored to gloss over their crimes with some specious pretense. But so far from doing this, their injustice and cruelty were so barefaced that to them was applied what is generally said of fishes, that the larger ones, though of the same species, prey on the lesser. One would be tempted, continues the same author, at seeing the most sacred laws of society so openly violated, to accuse Providence of being indifferent and insensible to most horrid crimes. But it is fully justified his conduct by punishing these two kings according to their deserts, and made such an example of them as ought in all succeeding ages to deter others from following their conduct. For while they are meditating to dispossess a weak and helpless infant of his kingdom, by piecemeal, providence raised up the Romans against them, who entirely subverted the kingdoms of Philip and Antiochus, and reduced their successors to almost as great of calamities as those with which they intended to crush the infant king. I find it interesting that Rome was raised up to defend the king of the south in this case. And yet, by the early part of the 7th century AD, Islam is being raised up to defend Protestantism against Rome, or at least run interference for them. Any thoughts? I, I don't understand what, what you're trying to say here. I, I do. And uh, okay, yeah, it's in, it's interesting how God can use our enemies for to defend us. Like, if I get you right there, Dwight, you're referring to the uh, men of the East keeping the scriptures safe. Well, we got the men of the East, and, and also distracting the Rome armies of Rome when they were about to have the victory over the Protestants. Both correct. What I'm looking at here is, here are these two kings, Philip and, Ant and Antiochus. As long as one somewhat of an equal was on the throne, they left Egypt alone. The moment that there is an infant under the care of others, they want to carve up the kingdom. Okay, and then we got um, Rome coming in to protect Egypt. Correct. Right, which is why we say that that's kind of what happened with uh, in the U U.S. as there was this, you know, during the time of Trump, particularly, that uh, Rome comes in and supports the Democrats. But I don't know. No, no, I'm not quite sure if I still fully understand that. But anyway, I'm going to have to think about it. Okay. Now, because next we're going to have the Battle of Neum, right? So, well, Smith is referring to this in about 200 BC. The Battle of Paneum took place when? Well, it's around 200. So, so the Battle of Paneum is going to be connected to all of that, and and that's where I, where I'm trying to figure out because um, we got Raphi and Paneum, right? So this this is interjected, verse 14, in this context of period between November 9th, 2019, and uh, July 18, 2020, Raffi and Paneum, right? So in, because in 1111, right, we're going to have the Battle of Raffia, right? And then when verse 13, this is addressing the Battle of Paneum, right? Um, and so that's going to be finally resolved here by the time we get to, uh, I guess I'm trying to look ahead in these verses, All right? So, yeah, so finally you get this this Sunday law happening, like in 
verse 16, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. So this is just describing what's also described in chapter 11, verse 40, 40 to 45, right? So that's the interesting thing about it is that that these verses that talk about historically the Battle of Raphi and the Battle of Paneum are typifying what happens in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, which we already sort of understood, right? Yeah, and we had made that application, but we didn't see that it's so clearly, clearly represented in these verses. But within these verses this, themselves, they have this repeat of history, right? That is, when we made an application of Raphia and Paneum to um, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, Right, to that history, when the movement had done that back in 2016, the end of 2016, the beginning of 2017, what what we didn't, um, what we thought we were doing is just seeing an application of these verses, as if we were looking at those verses and now just taking the present truth application out of them, that wasn't necessarily directly there, but we can see it actually is there, right? That is. These, within the book of Daniel itself, within Daniel 11 itself, it's taking these verses and repeating the history, right? That is, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, is a repeat of history of what happened earlier in Daniel 11, you know, 11 to uh, 16. And, and that, I don't, I don't think we had seen so clearly before. This is where um, you know, God declares the end from the beginning. He is doing it in Daniel chapter 11, if that makes sense. I, I'm not explaining myself well, but uh, hopefully people see what I mean by that. Raphi and Paneum already are meant to typify Daniel 11 verse 40. For instance, we say Daniel 11 verse 40a is Raphia, and Daniel 11 verse 40b is Paneum. And so we see that the king of the south coming against the king of the north, right? And then the king of the north coming against the king of the south. And so it's already built in, not something that we just are applying. It, it is part of the prophecy. Okay. Now, the Battle of Raphia took place roughly 17 years prior to the Battle of Panea. The Battle of Raphia is Ptolemy Philippator coming against Antiochus and his assembled forces and the battle of raphia is the one where ptolemy wins antiochus loses and it sets the stage for ptolemy thinking that he has gained a great victory now smith continues to establish the vision in quotes the romans being more prominently than any other people the subject of daniel's prophecy their first interference in the affairs of these kingdoms is here referred to as being the establishment or the demonstration of the truth of the vision which predicted the existence of such a power. So here we have some situations. Rome was founded in 753 BC. We have the Battle of Paneum in 217 but Rome is not a factor in this, right? This occurs between Ptolemy, king of Egypt, Antiochus, the king basically of Syria. Yeah, you're saying that, that Rome's not involved in the Battle of Tineum. Correct. Okay, so, well, they are sort of... Excuse, excuse me, he, they're not involved in Raphia. Oh, yeah, they're not involved in Raphia. They are involved in Tineum. Right? Correct. Because they in there. We know, of course, you know, part of our, our application that we have made in is that we we've narrowed this down. The application that we've that we're we've focused on has to do with what has happened within the movement as far as the prediction dealing with Trump and also with July 18th. Right. So these this time within that 777 structure. But we know Rafi and Paneum typify something that's still future, like midnight in the midnight cry. And so so we have 
we have made an application of Midnight and the Midnight Cry as, at different times within our lines where we're zoomed into these events, right, that have, that have happened within this movement. Okay. Okay. But we know that there is a waymark in the future called Midnight that, and the Midnight Cry that are going to be uh, part of that line that Jeff had in 2016. So the line that Jeff had in 2016, 9-11, Midnight, Midnight Cry, Sunday Law. In that line, we aren't to Midnight yet, right? Right. So we're not to Raffia. But when, when we've done our application, we have made this application more zoomed in rather than zoomed out. And, uh, you know, so we're going to, we, I, I don't know whether we, we should, you know, refine that more and explain it in some ways. But that's how we've looked at the present truth application. It's, it's always focused upon what's happening in this movement. That is, in our document where we have stuff in red, it, it has to do with the movement itself in, its, in connection with what's happening in the world. But we haven't, we haven't drawn it out to a broader application when we deal with it. In, in the present truth application, we, we, we say that that broader application is seen later in Daniel. So I'm still not quite sure how to address that. I think as time goes on, when I start putting this more in writing, um, we're going to have to come back to it and discuss it again. But um, so that's where I have a problem. We have a Rafi and Panin that we have applied. November 9th, 2019, July 18, 2020. That's where we predicted the pandemic and all these things that have happened. Um, right. But now we know that there still is a Rafi and Panin that's future. And maybe it's just now we can't see it until those events occur. But we know that what's happening in the movement is typifying what's going to happen. It is the wokeism that happened with Parminder's group is going to represent what's going to happen with Seventh Day Adventist Church, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we see that already beginning to happen. Comment, Kelly? It was just amen. Like okay. that is happening within our church. It is happening. Yeah, which was really surprising because back in 2019, when this was happening with Parminder's movement, then in 2020, didn't it happen with the church? Didn't the church soon follow afterwards, supporting BLM and 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 uh, wokeism, right? In, in, that it wasn't doing in 2019. Um, one that really got got people going was their support of the. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, but we saw this. It, it was a progression happen and and so the church shortly after followed the example of parminder and tess not that you know they knew that they were but but yeah they basically were in line with it yeah the pandemic of course is a huge thing dealing with that uh, the church supporting supporting the, the mandates okay smith continues but they shall fall some refer to this as to those mentioned in the first part of the verse who should stand up against the king of the south, others to the robbers of Daniel's people, the Romans. It is true in either case. If those who combined against Ptolemy are referred to, all that need be said is that they did speedily fall. And if it applies to the Romans, the prophecy simply looked forward to the period of their overthrow. I don't see a great issue with this statement. Any thoughts? Yeah, so, but they shall fall. So... Yeah, I, I think it has to be to the Romans that it's being talked about, that they are the ones that fall. Um, I wouldn't apply it to anyone else. Okay, verse 15. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities. And the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Now in the past, when we looked at this, the margin readings would have rendered the verse in this manner. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the city of munitions. And the arms of the south shall not withstand neither the people of his choices. Neither shall there be any strength to withstand. And shall there be any 
is italicized, so this is added in this verse. Any thoughts or comments on this particular passage at this point? Yeah, so as you point out, we, we looked at this passage quite a bit differently. Yes. Um, so, so the king of the north being Antiochus III, the USA, shall come. Um, and this is the Battle of Raph, uh, Battle of Phineum mentioned again, right? Mm-hmm. So we're going to say that this is November 9th, 1989. Um, that we're, that we're, we're, what we're doing is we're comparing Raphia being 1798 and Phineum being 1989. So we're, we're making that application in, in Daniel 11 verse 40 B, right? and cast up a mount. There's this economic and military pressure, you know, this siege, this casting of mount is a siege, and take the most fenced cities. Now, we applied that then to the apostate Protestant churches, right? That is, that's going to be about what happened with, uh, in that battle of taking of uh, Judea and Sidon. And the arms of the south, we apply then to the Soviet Union and Egypt under Ptolemy V, atheist and communism shall not withstand and, and stand up, um, so shall not stand up. That is, they're going to lose the Battle of Phineum on November 9th, 1989. And neither his chosen people is what the King James says, but we, there is nothing about neither his. It's just the people of his choice. And so there isn't a negative, a neither. Because the neither is later, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Um, and I'm not even sure. There, uh, this this verse we need to look at again. So this is part of the the thing that's, you know, we deal with Raphi and Phineum, and we make an application to November 9th, 2019, and to, to July 18, 2020. And then when we get to verse 15, we kind of jump back to our history. And that's where I'm having troubles with this. I got to think this through. I haven't. Uh, it, to me, I'm we're we're being a bit inconsistent. But there was a number of things here in this verse. For instance, this, the arms of the South, H two 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 zero plus H five zero four five equals seven two six five, which that number is nineteen point eight nine years. So if you you take that uh, as a period of time. And, and then it's going to have in a remainder of four hour, 4.26 hours. So a symbol of uh, the 26th day of the fourth month. So, so we have the 1989 symbol and that symbol for Josiah Lich's prophecy that gives us the 26th day of the fourth month, which gave us July 18th, 2020. So, I mean, we're gonna have to look, right now we're just looking at Uriah Smith. I don't know if we wanna go deeply into the present truth application because I think we have to come back to this again as I said later when I start working through the paper then you know I'll kind of run this by everybody but I do think we have to make the present truth application somewhere into the immediate part within the movement but we also have to look at this broader aspect so so I think both are correct but but I, don't, I think I'm mixing them up too much together, or we are, in how we, we address that. But we, need to, we need to see that one is typifying the other. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not really sure what to do with that. So we're, I'm, I'm not happy with it, I guess, is what I'm saying. Because I think verse 15, the way that we connect that to uh, 1989 is really solid. I think where I, I feel uncomfortable is with verse 14. I mean, we can make an application to our history, but I don't think that that would be the direct present truth application, uh, that we would need to broaden it out a bit more. So, you know, we have 1989. Anyway, but I don't want to go into the present truth too much yet, unless people think that we need to. I, I think we're just looking at what Uriah Smith is saying, and that's what we're trying to do right now. Okay. So one thing that Uriah Smith doesn't do is he doesn't like mention the Battle of Phineum directly. No. He mentions Raphia, but he, you know, he's describing the Battle of Phineum, but he's not going to mention it as a, as a word, right, as a title. So it's one of those things that was kind of hidden to our understanding. You know, we have to sort of dig that up to get, oh, this is the Battle of Phineum. 
to give it a name. I don't, I don't know why he doesn't name it as such, because other commentators do. They recognize that. Okay. The tuition of the young king of Egypt was entrusted by the Roman Senate to M. Emilius Lepidus, who appointed Aristomenes, an old and experienced minister of that court, as his guardian. His first act was to provide against the threatened invasion of the two confederated kings, Philip and Antiochus. To this end, he dispatched Scopus, a famous general of Aetolia, then in the service of the Egyptians, into his native country to raise reinforcements for the army. Having equipped an army, he marched into Palestine and Col Syria or hollow Syria, Antiochus being engaged in a war with Attalus in Lesser Asia, and reduced all Judea into subjection to the authority of Egypt. Now, is there something odd that we're seeing in this, the way that this is written? Well, there's some typos because it should be Col Syria with an O instead of an A and Antiochus instead of what you have there. And the Atolia is got a capital E there that shouldn't be there. Atolia. Atolia. Not sure why they did that. So you can correct those typos. Okay. But but that's that's sort of beside the point. I don't think that's what you're asking about, was it? No, it's it's quite not, but that's okay. <laughs> so the, the the thing that I, I notice, I'm not sure what it is you're noticing, but when I think about the confederation, so remember in Isaiah chapter seven we have the Confederacy. It's the king of the north, right, that's gonna be confederate. The northern kingdom is going to be confederate. That's the civil war that starts the beginning of the prophetic mirror. And then we have, uh, at the end of the prophetic mirror, we have confederation is in the south, right? The south is confederate. So here in this one, we're going to have the confederation again in the north, right? The king of the north is confederate. Uh, But there is, you know, the papacy is supporting king of the south, right? So so you've got Rome taking this young king of Egypt and uh, supporting supporting the king of the south. So I'm not sure, you know, how we address that. Because that, it's kind of like there's two confederacies here. I mean, Rome is in a sense confederate with, with Egypt. And then we have this king of Macedon, so the king of Macedon who's confederate with Antiochus. So you got these two different confederacies, and I don't know how we would relate that then to the confederacies at the beginning and the end of the prophetic mirror. Do they typify both of them? In the sense here, both are confederate? Okay. I don't know. Well, what I'm looking at, first, as, as he states, M. Emilius Lepidus appoints Aristomenes, So we do have these Latin Romans that are now fully vested in the care of this infant king in Egypt. Mm -hmm. But the Roman Aristomenes sends Scopus, the famous, a famous general of Aetolia. And what are we referring to when we're saying Aetolia? I don't know. We, we looked at this before, but I don't remember. Um, the, the reason that I'm asking the question in this way, I was led last night to start going through Smith's articles on Daniel 8. And when he's referencing Ayatolia, he's referencing Greece. Yeah, it is Greece. So yeah, Ayatol- uh, the mountainous region of Greece, right? Okay. North of the Gulf of Corinth. So in this situation, we have the Romans employing a Greek against other Greeks that are trying to take over Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it just it it seemed just a little a little different to me, a little odd, because within nine years of this battle. 
because this is the battle that's occurring in 200 BC. By 191 BC, the Romans are going to defeat the Greeks. Yeah. But the, it says here in Wikipedia that the Aetolians allied with the Romans while Philip V destroyed the Temple of Apollo, Thermius, and allied with the Carthaginians. And the Aetolians continued to fight on the side of the Romans, even in the Battle of Tyonocephalae in 196 BC, ignoring the great dangers looming for Greece as a result of this alliance. The Aetolians took the side of Antiochus III against the Roman Republic, and on the defeat of that monarch in 189 BC, they became virtually the subjects of Rome. Right. Right. Following the conquest of the Achaeans by Lucius, Lucius Mummius Achaeus. In 146 BC, Atolia became part of the Roman province of Achaia. Right. So obviously, the, their alliance isn't in their best interest. Right. So they may have felt, you know, being aligned with Rome, even though they're, they're taken over by Rome, they become part of the Roman Empire. I mean, it's it's really an. I mean, because Rome develops into this empire by making these alliances, right? Not necessarily by just destroying people in war. And, and people are happy to do it because they benefit from it. So maybe it was in their best interest, not as independents by like Greeks, but as, you know, for the people themselves in that area. I don't know, right? So, but yeah, you, you, you notice this, that... Uh, I'm not sure how we apply that. Now, the scriptures itself isn't addressing this alliance with the Ayatolia. This is just something that happens historically. It's not part of that story, per se, in the scriptures. So I don't know if we need to make an application of it. But what we could say, you know, if we were going to make an application, is that the papacy has allied itself with aspects of... Um, the globalists, right? Okay. But here, in this case, we, we're looking at the king of the north, that is Syria, the Seleucid Empire, as as typifying uh, the power that we would we would call, you know, apostate Protestantism. Now, it is Greece in a sort of sense because it's a division of Greece, but it's representing the king of the north is representing. Uh, republicanism and the king of the south is representing uh, the democrats right if we do it that way or we could say in a broader sense apostate protestantism and globalism right right so so there's, there is these multiple alliances of different factions or different aspects of these kingdoms that do parallel what we see happening as as these events unfold in this threefold union developing. Okay. Remind me of the remind me of the present day threefold union you're seeing, Theodore? Well well the threefold union of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Yeah, and the in the present day application you're seeing. Well I'm yeah, so I mean, what we're seeing right now is we see all these different powers that appear to be in opposition to each other, with but various types of alliances occurring on different levels, right? So the you know, apostate Protestants allies with the papacy, you know, to overthrow the Soviet Union, but still, you know, the papacy is going to align with the UN, which is the one that inherits that aspect of of um, the King of the South, right? And, and so there's all these little alliances going on as people are jockeying for position. But it's all going to end up in a threefold union united against God's people, right? So, so we see this type of thing happening here with um, this battle over the, pa the land of Palestine, right, the, the Levant, Part of what's happening you have this king of the north and the king of the south the reason why they're called north and south is because those are the two enemies of israel this is from the, the 
perspective of the land of Israel. That's why it's called the king of the north and the king of the south. Not so much because of which territory was conquered, right? Because Uriah Smith was kind of saying, well, you know, it's who's ever has the north is the king of the north, whoever has that, that initial kingdom. But Assyria is actually the east. So it didn't really make any sense. Anyway, you, you get what I'm saying here is that this is typifying that battle end at the end of the world. The king of the north and the king what? of the south are those enemies of Israel, and, and that's what's going to happen at the end of the world that we see in this battle between the king of the north and the king of south in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, that ultimately everybody comes against God's people at the end of the world. The beast, the that, false prophet, beast, dragon, and the false prophet yeah. unite against God's people, Israel being symbolic of God's people in the last days. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. The land of Israel. And what are those, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, or the papacy? The UN and the USA. UN and the USA. Okay. Nailed that. Okay, good. (laughs) Glad I could be of help. Okay. So now Smith continues. Thus affairs were brought into a posture for the fulfillment of the verse before us. For Antiochus, desisting from his war with Attalus at the dictation of the Romans, took speedy steps for the recovery of Palestine and Col Syria from the hands of the Egyptians. It should be Scopus, not Scopes. That's a different kind of a trial. Scopus was sent to oppose him. Near the sources of the Jordan, the two armies met. Scopus was defeated, pursued to Sidon, and there closely besieged. Three of the ablest generals of Egypt, with their best forces, were sent to raise the siege, but without success. At length, Scopus, meeting in the gaunt and intangible specter of famine, a foe with whom he was unable to cope, was forced to surrender on dishonorable terms of life only, whereupon he and his 10,000 men were suffered to depart stripped and naked. Here was the taking of the most fenced cities by the king of the north, for Sidon was, both in its situation and its defenses, one of the strongest cities of those times. Here was the failure of the arms of the south to withstand, and the failure also of the people which the king of the south had chosen, namely Scopus and his Aetolian forces. Now, Smith, well, I didn't see where I didn't see where you were reading. Is it on where you're reading? Just yes. Put your cursor where you finished reading. Put my cursor right there. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. Thanks. You bet. Smith has concluded his portion then on verse fifteen. He goes into verse 16, that he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So I find I find that uh, interesting that they were stripped, na- stripped and naked. It's almost right. like uh, that's what will happen for Laodicea. That's what has to happen with Laodicea. Right. Right. Although Egypt could not stand before Antiochus, the king of the north, Antiochus could not stand before the Romans, who now came against him. No kingdoms were long, longer able to resist this rising power. Syria was conquered and added to the Roman Empire when Pompey, B.C. 65, deprived Antiochus Asiaticus of his possessions and reduced Syria to a Roman province. So. Since the founding of Rome, it's interesting to see how the Roman progression has come about. In 217 BC, we have Raphia. In 200, we have Paneum. Now we're coming in down to BC 665, and we are seeing Rome as master of this area. 
The same power was also to stand in the Holy Land and consume it. Rome became connected with the people of God, the Jews, by alliance in B.C. 161, from which date it holds a prominent place in the prophetic calendar. It did not, however, acquire jurisdiction over Judea by actual conquest until B.C. 63, and then in the following manner. On Pompey's return from his expedition against Mithridates, king of Pontius, two competitors, Hyrcanius and Aristobulus, were struggling for the crown of Judea. Their cause came before Pompey, who soon perceived the injustice of the claims of Aristobulus, but wished to defer decision in the matter till after his long-coveted expedition into Arabia promising then to return and settle their affairs, as should seem just and proper. Aristobulus, fathoming Pompey's real sentiments, hastened back to Judea, armed his subjects, and prepared for a vigorous defense, determined at all hazards to keep that crown, which he foresaw would be adjudicated to another. Pompey closely... So, um, to comment on this first. So we have, just go back a bit. Okay. Can. Certainly. Yeah, so so this here, Canis and Aristobulus. So this, this is that issue that's happening. So we have this alliance, of course, 161 is, is where he dates it. But we know that there's uh, 161 and 158. There's a three-year period from when this league, the Roman Jewish League, first occurs to when it goes into effect. So... He's describing sort of how it's going to go into effect. It's going to have to do with Hyrcanus being supported. But I know Stephen is the one that's kind of the expert on this history. He spent a lot of time on it and establishing that we also have 158 BC. And there's a lot of confusion regarding this, like historically and, and within Adventism, uh, those who try to go to uh, the present truth application, or the present, uh, um, not the present truth application, but those that believe in the historical application as understood by uh, Miller, right? So we're going to be going back to the past. We're going to support Miller in 158 BC. So I don't know if, if Uriah Smith quite gets this right, though. Now, he's not going to give us the date 158 BC. But there is this um, Hyrcanus. I'm trying to remember. I can't remember all the details. I wish Stephen was here because he, he would just be able to explain it to us straight away. But, but I know it has to do with the, the support that's going on there. Now, against, basically against Greece. So, yeah. So now this would be John Hyrcanus. Would it be, or would it be Hyrcanus the second? Yeah, this would be Hyrcanus. I'm trying to figure out which person this would be. This is all explained in, in Jose Josephus explains this stuff. Also in Maccabees, uh, second Maccabees. I wish I remembered this history better. I, I always get really confused in this history because of the names of people. Okay, but Hyrcanus the second died in 30 BC. In Jerusalem. Yeah, so this would this would be John Hyrcanus. There, okay. Uh, no, it wouldn't be him either. So which Hyrcanus is this? Because John John Hyrcanus the second. Yeah, not not brief, that one. He was briefly king of Judea from 67 to 66 BC, and was ethnarch of Judea, possibly during the period of 47 to 40. <laughs> Yeah, that's not, it's not the second, it's the first one. So John Hyrcanus the first, he was born 175 BC and died 104 BC, was the high priest and ruler of the Jewish nation. So I don't know if that makes sense. He wouldn't fit in with that timeline. So it's got to be some other Hyrcanus. Yeah, I, yeah, I wish Stephen was here. I'm, I'm going to try to look this up and, and, sort this out because I, I really want to understand this history of these uh, this Roman Jewish League 
is what what the Arise Smith is presenting here doesn't it doesn't resonate with me that this is really the issue. It doesn't fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. There, there's something wrong here. That's that's yeah. yeah. But I I you know I can't say what it is right because I just don't know it well enough. But I know Stephen does. He he understands it. But if I work it out myself, then I understand it. Then there will be two of us that understand it. Okay. Um, it, it, we we kind of need to work some of these things out ourselves in order to, to get them in our heads, right? We can hear somebody say it. Yeah, Kelly says perhaps draw a line. I think that's what I really need to do is to kind of put this on the line. Of course, like next week, I'm I'm not going to be here for a couple of the studies, and then I'll be back in in. Uh, in Alberta next Thursday. So I'll be back there for the study all set up like I used to be, Lord willing, that I get back. Um, so yeah, so we need to we need to sort this out at, at some point uh, so that we, we got it simple, it's on a line, it's understandable, you know, some of these details. But yeah, this doesn't make sense to me. That is the verse itself, when when we're addressing this verse, this is verse 16, right? Correct. Yeah. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So here he's entered, introducing this, this alliance, which I don't think we normally place it here in this verse. Um, where do we normally place it? Now, the other thing here is that he shall do according to his own will. Uh, this is going to be Rome, right? Right. How, how is he doing this? The one because when we have somebody do according to his own will, it's introducing this new power. Greece did according to his own will, right? That is Alexander, and and we we have different. So here, he that cometh against him is Rome, right? And shall do according to his own will. So that's the Roman power. None shall stand before him. He shall stand in the glorious land. I guess that's where we're saying when he stands in the glorious land, that's the Roman Jewish league, right? Right. Uh, which by his hand shall be consumed. Okay, that makes sense now. So he stands in the glorious land. We would mark that as 158. Right. And then we have uh, 666 years. Um, inclusive to 508. That's what Miller did. So that's how he applied the 666. Yeah. So what he's saying here, I mean, he, he's kind of got things mixed up. Like it, it's just kind of jumble. It, okay. So anyway, go on. Just okay. me trying to sort all this out. Okay. So to reread this part of it, Aristobulus. Fathoming Pompey's real sentiments, hastened back to Judea, armed his subjects and prepared for a vigorous defense, determined at all hazards to keep that crown, which he foresaw would be adjudicated to another. Pompey closely followed the fugitive. As he approached Jerusalem, Aristobulus, beginning to repent of his course, came out to meet him and endeavored to accommodate matters by promising entire submission and large sums of money. Pompey, accepting this offer, sent Gabinius at the head of a detachment of soldiers to receive the money. But when that lieutenant general arrived at Jerusalem, he found the gate shut against him and was told from the top of the walls that the city would not stand to the agreement. Pompey, not to be deceived in this way with impunity, put Aristobulus, whom he had retained with him, in irons, and immediately marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. The partisans of Aristobulus were for defending the place. Those of Hyrcanius were, opening, were for opening the gates. The latter being in the majority and prevailing, Pompey was given free entrance into the city. Whereupon the adherents of Aristobulus retired to the mountain of the temple as fully determined to defend that place, as Pompey was to reduce it. At the end of three months, a breach was made in the wall sufficient for an assault. 
and the place was carried at the point of the sword. In the terrible slaughter that ensued, 12,000 persons were slain. It was an affecting sight, observes the historian, to see the priests engaged at that at the time in divine service pursue with calm hand and steady purpose their accustomed work, apparently unconscious of the wild tumult, though all around them their friends were being given to the slaughter, and though often their own blood mingled with that of their sacrifices. So it's kind of interesting that this situation was occurring. Yeah, and this is here Canis the second that's being talked about here. Right. Yeah. So so this is a later time. So so when you look at verse sixteen, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. So that's Rome asserting itself. Right. right. It's now beginning. Uh that's going to be 158 BC, and none shall stand before him. He shall stand also in the glorious land. I guess in him standing in the glorious land is 158 BC, and which by his hand shall be consumed. That's 63 BC. Okay. Right? So, so there's that whole history from the Maccabean uh, rebellion all the way up to the destruction, well, not destruction, but the. Uh, the siege of Jerusalem in 63 BC. And and what we we show is that when we went through this before, is that this Roman Jewish League, everything is explained in what happens to Israel. So they, they make this league, and then we're going to see unfolding the results of that league that end in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Right? Right. That is, it gets to verse 22, with the arms of the flood shall they be overflown from before him, and he shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. Right? So it's going to introduce this Roman Jewish league, right, uh, that they stand in the glorious land. It's going to describe the results of that league, and, and then it's going to go back and address the league again in verse 23, right? So if that makes sense. So that's how we had sorted it out before, that there is a repeat and enlarge, right? They introduce something, and then they show the results of it. Okay. And then And then it's going to get into... Then it's going to go back again and address the fall of of Egypt, dealing with uh, you know Antony and Cleopatra, right? It happens there. So now I remember how we did that. Uh, and then it's going to, of course, you're going to have uh, that that whole history described of of Rome, and then leading up to the papacy. Okay. So, so that was where the problem was, because um, we normally just would look at the Roman Jewish League in verse uh, uh, 23, right? And, and of course, Uriah Smith does that as well. Rome makes a league with the Jews in 1123. That's, that's going to be his subheading. So, but but it, it it's mentioned also in verse 16, but more more obliquely, right? It doesn't refer to the league as such. So it's going to talk about what's going to happen, and then it, it describes what's going to happen, and and the end result of it. So yeah, there's there's lots of detail here, that, and and it's good to be going through this again, in in the historical application. We'll we'll, we'll look at the present truth application later on. But. Okay. Now, the final paragraph of this section, having put an end to the war, Pompey demolished the walls of Jerusalem transferred several cities from the jurisdiction of Judea to that of Syria, and imposed tribute on the Jews. Thus, for the first time, was Jerusalem placed by conquest in the hands of that power, which was to hold the glorious land in its iron grasp till utterly consumed. So that's Smith's viewpoint 
on this portion. Any thoughts yeah. on this last paragraph? Yeah, so so that's going to obviously be 70 AD. Right. Right, so when they're, when they're utterly consumed. And that's the result of the Roman Jewish League. So it's going to describe that now in more detail in the, in the following verses. Right, it's going to go all the way back to what Rome does and how it ends up uh, with this Roman Jewish League and then the destruction of Jerusalem. So, so there is this repeat and enlarge within Daniel chapter 11. Now, most people, like most commentators, Protestant commentators, especially the preterists, they're going to try to apply all of this to Greece. That is, when you look at these verses, it's not going to be about Rome. It's still going to be about Greece. But we have passed to Rome, just as we did from Medo-Persia to Alexander, keeping a lot of that history, right? Okay. Like, we're not going to be looking at the Tychus Epiphanies in here. No. Right? Because Rome is already there. So now, now we're concerned with Rome. Just like, you know, we had Xerxes. There's this battle against Greece that he's going to lose. And then Alexander the Great is the next one that does according to his own will. So in verse 16, we now have Rome. We don't have, you know, a Tychus Epiphanies. Because that's who they're going to have that does according to his own will, is the Tychus Epiphanies, right? The, you look at other commentaries. Let me see here if I can wonder where they uh, would have to look at some of these other commentaries. Anyway, so, so we know that, that our view is different I'm just looking at these different commentaries. Yeah, because they're going to get a Tychus Epiphanies in verse 21. So they're going to have, and they're still going to have in this history, they're going to have uh, Tychus the third, and then when they get to verse 21, they have Antiochus the fourth, which is Antiochus Epiphanes. So they're yeah. going to have him be the vile person, but we're going to have that vile person be Tiberius. Right. So, so that quite a, a divergence occurs in these verses between those that believe that Atticus Epiphanes is the one that defiles the temple and those that um, see that all being actually Rome and, um, and you know, coming against the prince of princes and so forth. All those things, yeah, the prince of the covenant, right? So in verse 11, verse 22, the prince of the covenant we take as Christ. But those that have a tie kiss epiphanies, they say, oh, the prince of the covenant, that's the priest, the high priest. So, so it's a lot of differences here. But so Uriah Smith is following, you know, generally what, uh, correctly. He's, he's got Rome here, and Rome is the one that's going to stand in the glorious land. So this is going to bring us to... 63 BC, and by which by his hand shall be consumed is 70 AD. Okay. So that, that period of 132 years is, is spanned in that one verse, the last half of that verse. Okay. So, so I guess uh, Sunday, I should be able to join in on Sunday and Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday next week, I won't. And then Thursday, I'll be back home. So, um, so on Sunday, Monday, I guess, what are we going to be covering? Well, we're going to have the the portion to start with verse 17 to 20 from these articles and setting the okay. stage for some of the rest of what, what we're going to be doing after that. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, good. What, can I ask what um, articles... Is it still in the review in Harrow? Yes. Yeah, well, is, that really? not, is, that, is that in 1970? I mean, 1870, excuse me. We're going to be dealing with an article starting from 24th of January of 1871. Oh, 71, okay. And this oh. one, this one will have the, the interesting portion that on the biblical date, it was the second day of the 11th month of the biblical year 5915. So 211 
And it's going to be that way on the rabbinic calendar and also the Islamic calendar. So this is going to be one of those that's that's going to have some other import for us to consider. Any other thought or questions at this time? Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of study that you have given us this week. We thank you for this ability we've had to assemble together. We praise you for the ideas that you are bringing to our minds and helping us to understand. Be with us each one today. Guide us until we can assemble again. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.